Good morning. And happy Mother's Day to the mamas. If you're a mom, stand up for just a sec, would you? Just, just come on, stand on up. Yeah, stay up, stay up. Amen. Stay up because we want to we wanna pray for you. I know that moms have the hardest job on the planet, I think, because uh, you got to deal with a lot of stuff that us guys just aren't willing to deal with, like diapers and things like that and people throwing up. And I remember when Erin was little, man, there were some times I was like, babe, I can't do this. I will throw up. And she was like, I'll do it. So thank God for mamas, amen, and all that they do. So would you, if you're next to a mom, would you just lay your hand on her? If you're right next to another mom, go for it. Lay your hand on her. Father, we thank you today for moms, and we bless them. We speak life over them today. God, I pray that this next season of their life, Lord, that you would cover them and wash them and be near them. I pray, Lord, that their relationship with you would grow. I pray that their heart's desires uh, would come to fruition with their children, God. We just just believe the best for our kids, and, and I just pray that those dreams would come to pass. We love you, Lord, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Have a seat. If you have your Bible, open it to Genesis chapter 2. We're in a new series um, called Principle of First. And you'll know what that means in just a minute. I was looking through Scripture, and I asked myself the question. I said, what are the things that God really made a big deal about throughout Scripture? And what were the things first that he said, hey, you got to do this stuff. This is really important to you. So we're going to talk about the priority of first. We're going to talk about two priorities today. One is the priority of rest. And two, and you go, rest? Yes, rest. And the other one is return. So we're going to talk about rest and return. Um, How many of you are tired? Our world is so crazy busy. And they told us that when we got computers and when we got cell phones that our lives would slow down. And I've actually found that that's not true. My life has actually sped up. And, and I am so much more connected right now than, frankly, I want to be. Does anybody ever feel that way? How many of you pick up your phone sometimes and don't even know why? How many of you be at dinner with somebody and you will reach into your pocket and pull your phone out? And it hasn't beeped or nothing. You just, it's the habit, huh? I've just, oh, wait, whoa, it's in here. I wonder what's going on on Facebook. Oh, look, somebody's having a donut. I mean, we're just so connected. <laughs> and I want to I wanna walk you through the principle of rest because it's something that we have neglected in our society and in our day. Everything needs rest. Tyler and I were talking about, th- about this on the airplane coming home from L.A. on Friday Pastor Tyler and I, and we talked about things that need rest, and we were like, dirt needs rest. Did you know that? If you don't rest the land that they, that they plant and, and, and do, you know, uh, produce and all that stuff, they rest the land because if they don't, it becomes inferior. Did you know that bowling pins need rest? I dare you, not now, later, Google it. Bowling pins, they rest bowling pins. I'm like, why would you rest a bowling pin? Read up on it. It's fascinating. If, <laughs> bowling pins need rest. So, and actually God, when he created the world, we're going to see it in a minute, he rested. But wait, I thought the Bible says that God never grows weary or grows tired. It's because that when he, for six days, he was speaking into existence. If you look at the word rest, it actually means to breathe in. So how did God create the world? With his words. And he was breathing out, speaking, and breath was coming out. And at the end, he rested. This is good. That's what he said. Now, I'm I'm going to show you how God wants us to enter into this same rest. And we almost wear, like in our day, if you work 80 hours a week, some people wear it like a badge of honor. Well, I worked 120 hours this week. Wow, you're really cool. Oh, I worked 900 hours this week. There's not 900 hours in the week, dude. But we wear it as a badge of honor. And I'm, I'm going to say some things today that are going to be, I think, hard to hear. Is that cool? I'm going to say some tough stuff. Because I think we're doing damage to ourselves and to our loved ones and to the world basically around us, the people around us, because we're so overworked and under-rested. 
This generation has more stuff than any generation before it, and it's the most unsatisfied generation. We have more of everything, and yet we're completely anxious and unsatisfied, and I think I know why. I really, I really, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show it to you today. In the Ten Commandments, now the Ten Commandments don't save us. Would you agree with that? Jesus saves us, his blood, his cross. But there are consequences when we disobey the Ten Commandments. Would you agree with that? The Ten Commandments are good. How many of you just, let's just, how many think the Ten Commandments are good? How many know you shouldn't kill somebody? Are you, are you good with that one? Watch this. Thou shalt not kill. Yes, please. Thank you. Don't commit adultery. That's a good thing. It damages family and tears people apart. Don't have idols. We have all of these Ten Commandments that there's a commandment that we overlook completely, and it says, keep the Sabbath holy and rest. And you and I are good with don't kill and good with don't have idols, but sometimes we're a little freaked out when it comes to rest because we just blow right past it. So we can break the do not, we don't want to break the do not kill, we don't want to break the do not have idols, but we'll break the go ahead and just run your life into the ground. And actually in churches, I've heard pastors say this before, I don't want to, I don't want to rust out, I want to burn out for God. Yeah. What? What, what? What are you talking about? Yeah, I don't want to rust out. So what are you saying? I don't want to get old? Because I know pastors that ran their lives into the ground. They actually physically died because they gave so much. And everyone, oh, for Jesus, amen. No, 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 no. They damage their bodies, their hearts, their minds, their emotions, their families. I do not believe it's God's will for us to burn out. And I don't believe it's God's will for us to rust out. I believe it's God's will for us to be rested and be filled with his spirit. And to do his will. Amen? I don't want to burn out. By the way, I've told you the story before that I did, literally, I was a workaholic for the first 15 years of our marriage. We're going on 29, almost 30. And we're, we're at those 15 years, I was an absolute workaholic. I was that guy, 90 hours this week, I did it all. And I actually had a bleed in my brain. I was in the ICU, and the doctor told me straight up, dude, you're burning the candle at both ends. I was a divisional superintendent. I was a pastor. I was this guy. I was traveling. I was preaching. And everyone stood around and applauded. Wow, what a guy. And when I burned out, guess who was around? Nobody. Oh, what a weakling. No, it's because I violated the very simple thing that God gave me as a gift, and that is rest. And so let's look at it. Let's look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And, and God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all of his creation. So God created the, this amazing world. I want you to catch this. God created this amazing world in six days and that sixth day, he created man. And what was the first day that he really lived was the day of rest. And I want to show you something. God doesn't need our help. He didn't, he didn't create man on the first day because probably we would have been all up in his business telling him how to do it. Because <laughs> we think we know better. Well, I'm, I'm, I, God, you shouldn't have made giraffes. They're weird. They get, they're going to have neck problems. You know what I mean? We would have been giving God all kinds of tips and all kinds of stuff about his creation. And I find it interesting that when God created us, he created us and we entered into a day of rest. And there is something that God has called us to enter in in Christ. And that is, if you read the writings of Paul, that we would enter into the rest of Christ. Because you can't earn your salvation. You can't, you can't do enough good works to earn your way into his kindness. So watch. We enter into his rest. He made us so that we could rest and be with him. And we have violated that in a huge way, I think, in our day. I actually know people that, that, that on the, uh, don't, don't have a day a week that they rest. Not even a two hours in their day. And today, in our society, I, I've never seen it, and this is where I'm going to offend people. For, don't forgive me. Just deal with it. <laughs> I've never seen families more busy than now. It's unbelievable to me. 
I, I, my mom and dad would have told me, mom, dad, uh, I want to play lacrosse. I want to play baseball. I want to play football. I want to play basketball. I want to swim. I want to do, do this. My mom and dad would have said, no, you pick something you like, and that's what we're going to do. But see, we can't stand the fact to think about that our kid might not be good at something. You know what I mean? So, man, we got our kids in all these sports and all this stuff, and we're running them to death, and they got homework till midnight. And I'm thinking, this kid's in the eighth grade, and he's got mono because he's burnt completely out. And we're teaching our kids, we're not teaching our kids how to rest, we're teaching our kids how to be frantic and busy, and oh, we gotta keep going. And there are some parents, God bless you, but you're living your life through your kid because you didn't make the hoop team, and you didn't get to go to college. So now you got your kid, and you're like, you're gonna, hey buddy, you're gonna do your, your NBA for you. And the poor kid's just <sighs> overwhelmed by, your, by what you think he's gonna be. And we're just, we're, I watch parents, and I'm like, dude, you're, a, you're, you're like a limo driver all day long. It's all you do. Boy, some of you right now, I can just see it. You're like, <laughs> sports are good for kids. They make kids have, have, you know, all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yada, yada. <laughs> so your kid grows up. He's a great baseball player, has no appetite for Jesus, no appetite for the things of God, goes away to college. Let's say he becomes the big guy, or, or whatever. Whatever. And he gets famous and he makes millions of dollars and then you wonder, why is his life a wreck? How come he's choosing all this stuff that's wrong? Because there was never a foundation of godliness for him. He wears the what would Jesus do bracelet, but what would Jesus do isn't in here, it's on his wrist. Because we've never taught our kids the things that are important. We've majored so much on things that are good. There's nothing wrong with playing basketball and doing those things. But you, do you understand what I'm getting at? I give you permission to not do that, to not be that busy and that crazy. I, it bums me out, too, that Sunday is the day that everything's starting to happen. I remember when I was a kid, my mom and dad said, is it on Sunday? Yeah, no. Why? Why, Mom? You're mean. No, because we're going to church, because church is important. Worship and hearing God's word and you growing up to be a man of God is more important than you playing baseball because you're not that good anyways. <laughs> like, dude, you're not good. You're not getting a scholarship. It's all good. The percentage of kids that actually get scholarships and go on and do greatness is so, so tiny. But everyone that follows Jesus and gets a hunger for God wins. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right. I'm on my soapbox. I'll jump down. Hey <laughs> God can do more. Listen to what he's saying here. God can do more. He gave us a day to rest. He's like this. I can do more in six days than you can in seven. I can multiply everything. Okay. The average, I heard a guy say this is amazing. The average fast food restaurant, average, so there's some that make more, some that make less, makes a million dollars a year. A million dollars a year. That's the profit that they bring in. Boom. There is a famous little restaurant that sells chicken. And they're not open on Sundays. Can anybody guess? Yeah, when I first moved here, every couple Sundays, we'd drive over. No, let's get some Chick-fil-A. And we get to Chick-fil-A, guess what? It's closed. Ah! And you read it. We're closed today so our families can rest and worship. They're a Christian company. They're closed on the largest retail day of the week. Sunday is when most businesses make the most money. Do you know how much the average Chick-fil-A brings in a year? Five million dollars. Just absolutely destroying the competition. Why? Because they're choosing that day that the Lord said, man, you need to rest and chill out. And they're choosing it. And the Lord, see, remember when, they, uh, when God made manna, God gave them manna, and what did he say to them? Hey, six days. And on the sixth day, gather a little bit more, because on the seventh day, you ain't going to have none. And they'd go out on the seventh day, oh, oh, and they couldn't find it. Why? Because it's the day that God intended us to rest and be with our families. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the Sabbath and about what I believe it is and what I see in Scripture. Because some people take the Sabbath and they make it the, ban the badge that they wear of, I don't do anything on, on the Sabbath and church shouldn't be on Sunday and we should just... 
and I worship on the day of rest. And I'm like, well, wait, no, God never talked about church not happening. He talked about you resting, you filling your tank, you being with your family. You rest. It's a gift to you from God. And the Pharisees took the Sabbath and perverted it and made it something that God never intended it to be. They, made, they created all these laws and weird. You can't spit on the Sabbath. Did you know you couldn't spit on the Sabbath? Because it was irrigating the land. You're working. Isn't that weird? Who created that? Some Pharisee walking around. Oh, some dude. Oh, no, you can't. You're irrigating the land. What? Go read about it. They had the craziest laws on the Sabbath, and then here comes Jesus on the scene and blew their minds because he did a whole bunch of stuff on the Sabbath that they didn't like. And we'll get into that in just a minute. Exodus 20, verse 8 says this. Remember to observe the Sabbath day. Call it this, the day of rest. It's a holy day. By keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. But the seventh day is, is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do work, any work. Isn't that great? We're like weird about that. Like God's like, no, you don't have to do any work. Thank you. This includes you, your sons, your daughters, your male, and your female servants, your livestock, any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. And people say, well, it was for the people of Israel. It's not for me and you. God rested long before the law. And I'm going to tell you right now, if God knows best and he says that we need rest, I'm going to take it. Okay, let's just say it is for Israel, not for us. I'm taking it as mine. Because it's a day of rest. And I want to make it. I don't want, my brain doctor told me I had a brain. That was news to my mom and dad. When they did my brain scan, I had the bleed in my brain. He actually said to me, you're overworking yourself. He said, listen to what he said. He said, you, you. Tell me about your sleep habit, habits. I said, well, you know, I go to bed about 12, 30, 1 o'clock, and I wake up about four times, and then about 5 o'clock, I get up, maybe 4 o'clock, and I go about my day. And, he, and I thought it was normal. And he goes, say it one more time. And I told it to him, and he goes, dude, if you keep going that way, you will die early. Your body was not intended nor created to, to work like that. So I had to tell people, like, Hey, man, no, I can't come and do this anymore. Nope, I can't travel. No, I can't come speak. And I had to whittle my life down to, to not be such a workaholic. Why? Because it was, watch this, I was sinning against myself. I know a pastor who, um, he burned out. He literally traveled, you would know his name, and I don't want to say his name, but he, he traveled all over uh, the world and preached, and he was a senior pastor, and, just a really amazing guy. And one day on his travels, he came home and opened up his dresser drawer and he had no underwear. In his dresser drawer and he had to travel the next day. And he sat down on the ground and started crying. A grown man crying because he didn't have underwear. Isn't that weird? And he's like, oh man, I'm falling apart. And he called a good buddy of his and said, man, I don't know what's going on with me. I, I just, and the guy goes, I know what's going on with you. You're exhausted. He goes, Think about it. All you have to do is go wash underwear in the washing machine and dry it, right? But he was so exhausted, so he took off six months. He took six months off. And on the 52nd day of his sabbatical, he was resting. He started to feel normal and good. And, and oh, yeah, I got my oats back. And he was praying, and he said to the Lord, wow, Lord, this is really cool that I'm starting to feel rested. And the Lord spoke to him and says, yeah, think about how many days are in a year. I mean, how many weeks are in a year? 52. It was the 52nd day. And he, re he put it together for, for a whole year he hadn't rested. For one year he was just every day, seven days a week. And he said to the Lord, Lord, I owed you 52 days? And the Lord spoke back to him and said, no, you owed yourself 52 days. See, God gives us the Sabbath as a rest for our soul, for our brains, for our emotions, for our life. And we just run it ragged. So my day of rest, and people go, oh, well, it has to be on Sunday. No, I, I don't believe that. I believe that it, you just need to choose a day. I choose Monday as my, as my Sabbath. Tomorrow is my Sabbath. 
So here's what I do. And I'm starting to do this, and I'm going to be honest with you. I've stumbled, and then I, I go back, and I, and I do it again. But on, on, on Monday, I do not look at my computer. No emails. No, no phone. The little iPhone. Beep, bop, boop, boop. It's always telling me stuff. I put it on the charger, and I turn it off. You can't turn your phone off. What if you miss a call? Oh, that's the point. (laughs) If you think you're so important that you miss one phone call, the world's going to collapse. That's why the Lord made man on the sixth day and not on the first day. You think you're that good and everything revolves around you. And I don't care if you're the CEO of the biggest company in the world. You need a day to rest. And stuff can wait. Amen? Amen. I've had people call me, oh, my marriage is falling apart. We're getting divorced. I need you right now. Hold on, wait a second. How many years have you been married? 25 years. Okay, this didn't happen in a week. This took 25 years to get here. So guess what? We'll meet tomorrow. What? Yeah, you're going to be all right. You've been in this boat for 25 years. We can wait till tomorrow. Somebody goes, that's so mean-spirited. No, it's not. Because there will always be something to pull you out of rest and into work. Always. Look right here. Always. Well, I can't rest. on. No, you can rest on it. You take a day and you take a break. No emails. Why? Because those emails, I'll be resting. Those emails come. Boop, boop. Somebody writes, I don't like your sermon. I didn't like this. I didn't like that. And then what happens to me? internally I'm worked up it's my day off it's my day of rest and I'm doing stuff with Cindy and I'm thinking about the church and I'm thinking about so and so and I'm thinking about this crisis in this family and the Lord's like you're not God you're a pastor not a savior and I go okay can I just challenge you to turn your phones off some one day a week oh man somebody like I can't do it it's addictive that's the problem Get a dumb phone that does nothing. (laughs) Mark chapter 2, verse 23. (laughs) One Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat them. And the Pharisees said to Jesus, Look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, Haven't you ever read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God and broke the law by eating and, uh, the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. He also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, here's the key, right here. The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people, not Uh, and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord over the Sabbath. Watch. Let me say it one more time. God did not make the Sabbath so we could be a slave to it and, and fulfill all these crazy requirements. He made man to rest on the Sabbath. He gave us a gift to rest. And if you go to the next chapter, just bump to Mark chapter 3, he proved the point right here that he is the Lord over the Sabbath. Jesus went in the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. Isn't that crazy? There are actually people in the world that what they want to do is just watch people's lives so they can criticize their life. Isn't that nuts? By the way, I've been a pastor 30 years. I've never experienced that in the church. They just want to. They just want to get on you about everything. So they're watching him close, and if he healed the man's hand, they plan to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, "Come stand in front of everyone." And then he turned to his critics and asked, "Does the law permit? This is the this is the key right here. Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath, or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or destroy it?" So there's the point. The day of rest is to save your life. It's to be a blessing to you, not to be a religious curse where you're just like, whoa. Like, go play golf. If golf fills your tank, golf fills my tank. I play golf on my day of rest. Why? Because it fills me up. I don't do anything on my day off that doesn't fill my tank. If it doesn't fill my tank, I don't do it. Why? Because I need, I need a break. I need rest. So do you. But they wouldn't answer him. Of course they wouldn't because they're cowards. Verse 5. 
Then he looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. And he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. And at once the Pharisees went away and met with supporters of Herod to kill, to plan to kill Jesus. On the Sabbath, hey, you can't do that, Jesus. What are you doing? You can't, you can't do, are you kidding me? Sabbath was made for life. Matter of fact, Jesus even said, which one of you on the Sabbath, if your ox falls into a ditch, you won't go save him? So what did Jesus say? There are times on your Sabbath that there are emergencies that you have to go take care of. And there are real emergencies, and those are the things you go take care of. Jesus actually permitted it. Hey, if there's a problem on the Sabbath, take care of it if it's really an emergency. And it's about life and death. Do you get the point? Jesus gave us the gift of Sabbath. And I, I want to challenge you to let God do more with six days than you can do with seven. Watch him provide for you. He provided enough for them on the sixth day with manna to last the seventh day. And when they would go out on the seventh to find more, they never found it. I know people who work on Sundays or just, they, I mean, let, me, let me remind, they don't take a break. They work seven days a week, whether it's they, you know, Monday or whatever. And, I, and, and I'm like, man, you're, you need to just obey the Lord and let the Lord take care of you because he will. You'll sell more on 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 that other day than you would on the day that you're violating and not resting. I really believe that. God's a supernatural God. He wants to be supernatural to you. Amen? All right, we got five minutes, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit the next one because they're related to each other. You got rest, and you got return. And why I'm tying in return, which is tithing, and this is a big subject. I probably need... About 30 minutes for this one, but I'm going to do it in five. In the book of Exodus, chapter 13, I want to read you a couple of verses. Exodus 13, verse 12. And that you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb. That is, every firstborn that comes from animal, which you have, the males shall be the Lord's. Exodus 23, verse 19. The first of all your first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your possessions. And with the first fruits of your increase. First fruits. Everyone say first fruits. It's first. It's the first thing you do. So your barns will be with, uh, filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So the first, if you look throughout scripture, belongs to the Lord. It always has. It always will. Matter of fact, when they went in, the children of Israel went in to take the first city, Jericho. What did God say to them? This is my city. You come in and take it, but don't, you can't have the spoils. You can't have those things. Why? Because it belongs to me. How many cities did they end up taking? Ten. God gave, watch this, tenth went to the Lord. The first city went to the Lord. And the one guy, we know the story, Achan, he took stuff. And oh, these are the new Nike Airs. And he hid him in his tent. And what happened? They couldn't stand against their enemies. They couldn't win. And, and, and Joshua went before the Lord, Lord, what's going on? Somebody took something that's not, spo- that's not theirs to take. And they ended up killing their family and burning them all. I mean, it's a terrible story. The first belongs to the Lord. And people say, well, wait a second. That's an Old Testament principle. It's not in the New Testament. Okay. Jesus never once, ever, says you shouldn't tithe. Matter of fact, people came to him and said, Lord, what should I do? I tithe and I do all this stuff. And Jesus said, it's good that you tithe. This is what he said. It's good that you tithe. Why? Because it was a principle long before the law. People say, oh, it's of the law. No, people, people, if you look in the Old Testament, people tithe 10% their first fruits to the Lord 400 years before the law. It's a principle, not a law. And why does God do that? Why in the world would God say, give me 10% of your increase and of your first fruits? Why would he do that? For the same reason he says, give me a day, I'll give you a day of rest because I can do more in six than you can in seven. I can do more with your 90 than you can do with your 100%. It's the same principle. And by the way, you've heard me say it before, tithing, I tithe every time I get paid, I give 10% to the church. 10% of my pay goes to the church. And watch this. It is the first thing I do. It's not the second, not the third, not the fifth. It's my first thing. I get a checkout. I write out 
10% of, of, of my income and I fold it up and I say, Lord, thank you so much that you're my provider. I am not my provider, you are. The church is not my provider, you are. It's the reminder to you and I that he is our provider, not you. And the world's all busy trying to prepare trying to provide and get rich and get wealthy and blah, 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 back and forth. Everyone's all flipped out about money. And the Lord's like, dude, I own it all. I'll take care of you. It's the first thing I do, first fruits, boom. Jesus never said don't do it. And matter of fact, the people that have argued with me about it the most are the ones, that, now some, some truly don't believe it's a New Testament principle. Others say, it, it, they argue too, but they're arguing from the standpoint of, I, I'm just stingy. There is a nerve that runs from here, right here, it goes right up here and it attaches itself to the heart. You start talking about this and people get nervous. Do you know Jesus talked more about money than anything? If you look in scripture, faith is not talked about as much as money is talked about. Being saved is not talked about as much as money. Why? Because he knew. Jesus said you can't love mammon. You can't love money. You can't lean on the idol of money and serve me too. That's a bold statement. So wait a second, Lord. It takes money to run in this world. I mean, that's how we pay our rent, our power bill, our food, all that stuff. And yet you say we can't serve it. Man, that's kind of crazy. He goes, no, listen, I'll use it because I'll give it to you to be a blessing but you can't serve it. You can't love it. You have to love me. And for me, what tithing does is it sets in, in place who is Lord and who is not. And Cindy and I, when we first got married, I've told you this, my mom and dad tithe all the time. Blue collar workers, not wealthy. And I remember them sitting at the table writing the tithe check making sure that I saw them do it. Okay, writing the tithe check. <laughs> well, I hope we have enough to cover these bills. And I remember thinking, what? We're giving the church money and we don't know if we're gonna have. And do you know how many times I watched the Lord provide for our family? I, I, as a little kid, watching miracles happen, God bringing this and God bringing this. Why? Because he honored that. And so I grew up like tithing is a no-brainer. Cindy grew up in a house, no tithing. And so when we got married, guess what happened? What do you mean you want to give 10%? And some people, listen, some people go, oh, man, okay, I'll give 10%. 10%, $200 is $20. Yeah, cool. And you remember the story of the guy who, who made $200 a week and man, he told his pastor he was really struggling so he started tithing and the Lord blessed his business and all of a sudden he came back to the pastor and said, Pastor, this year has been amazing. I went from $200 a week, I'm making seven grand a week now and I'm really struggling with writing that $700 check every week. Would you pray for me? Sure. Come here, let me pray for you. Lord, send him back to making $200 a week. <laughs> Because that check, when it gets bigger, some people go, oh, if I was a millionaire, I'd tithe. No, you wouldn't. If you're not tithing on the little bit that you're making now, there is no chance you're writing a $100,000 check. It's not happening. And by the way, God's not going to do that to you. He's not cruel and mean. He's not going to give you a million dollars so that you can destroy yourself if you're not ready for it. See, there's the principle of, watch, rest. Lord, you can do more in, in, in six days than I can in seven. And it's the principle of the return. Tithing is not giving. It's returning to the Lord what is his. Some of you go, yeah, well, you're the pastor of the church, and you just want our money. No, I don't. I don't. I want you to be blessed. I remember in Burbank, my church in Burbank, I remember a bunch of them cooed the first year I was there because nobody wanted change. How many of you know that I bring change sometimes? And I was young and wild and things were growing and they started a coup. We're not tithing anymore. And it got back to me. People aren't going to tithe unless you put the flag back and put the organ back. So I stood up, uh, <clears throat> I stood up in front of the church and I just said, listen, I love you. You're amazing. But I want you to be blessed. 
So if you don't trust my leadership, you need to find a church where you do trust that leadership so you can obey the word of God and tithe. Backfire. Everyone went, aww. Why? Because I don't trust your tithe to be my provision and the church's provision. I trust the Lord. So when people try to use their tithe, like I had a guy one time try to use his tithe as a, tithe as a bargaining chip with me. He literally tried to use his tithe as a bargaining chip with me. He came into my office and said, I write a very sizable check to this church. I said, that's awesome. Thanks, man. He goes, what, you don't know? No, I don't look. I don't know who tithes, how much they tithe. I do not look. As the past, I don't care. I don't know who's tithing big and who's tithing small because I don't want to treat you all different. I want to treat you the same. We're bros and sisters, right, in, in the kingdom. And you go, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the church and uh, I'll take my tithe with me if you don't stop making changes. And I remember just looking at him like, I think this guy gives a lot of money to the church. That's right. That's what I felt like in my heart. Like, oh, God, I think this guy really does tithe a lot. And I said, well, bud, here's the deal. By the way, this has happened more than once. This has happened several times. Here's the deal, man. I, I guess you're going to have to find a new church. And he just looks at me. I says, because I'm not, you're not going to be my Lord. Your money's not going to become, I'm not going to become a slave to your dollar. And if you think you can use the tithe as a bargaining chip, then you got bigger problems than you, we need to send you to counseling right now. And man, he left the church and our tithe went up that year in this little church. Our tithe went up 450 grand that year. $450,000 was a ton of money. And then he came back to the church. Like, like what's going on? I wonder if they've, this, the ship has gone down because I'm gone. Like, Bro, you're not God. And so with the crazy thing, they, they came back to the church, repented, and started living life with us again. It was amazing. But God taught me a great lesson. Money is not God. He is the Lord. And he's, so, so when, I, when, when people say, I don't talk about money all the time. How do you know? I don't talk about money in the church all the time. I don't. Because I'll talk about tithing because I believe in the principle of tithing. And I want you to be blessed. So there's only one place in scripture where God says, test me and see. One place where the Lord says, tempt me, try me. And it's in the area of tithing. He goes, go ahead, check it out, do it, and then see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out blessing upon you. And then people say, well, wait, but I don't tithe and I'm blessed. Think about where you would be if you tithed. Some of you are geniuses financially. You're just, and the Lord's blessed you. Think about where your life would be. So I don't care if you make $50 a week or $50,000 a month. The principle is the same. The size of the check doesn't matter. What matters is what's going on in here. So I'm going to challenge you to take a day and rest and be with your family and leave the, all the ding, dong, bing, bong, put it down. Sleep, read your Bible, pray. Knit, if that's what you like to do. Go play golf. Oh, I can't. I'm so busy. Then you're too busy. If you're too busy to not rest, you're too busy. Look at your wife, your son, your daughter, and ask yourself the question, do you want to be around when, they're, when, when that daughter or that son's getting married? Because I know many great, great men and women who have died way too early they, they destroyed themselves because they didn't rest. Two things, rest and return to the Lord that which belongs to him. Yeah? Just return it. It's not giving. It's this. Lord, you said that the, the first fruits belongs to you. Here you go. This is, this is yours. It's not even mine. And see what the Lord will do. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. One person clapped. <laughs> Yay, that was terrible. I feel horrible. <laughs> no, 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 no. You don't got to do that. I just, I just think it's funny. Like the guy, it was, it was one of those claps that was like, I'm not really sure. <laughs> I'm scared right now. <laughs> oh, Lord, thank you. Father, I ask you to bless the people that sit before me. God, would you truly teach us how to rest, not just physically, but to rest in you? to rest in the fact that you created the earth in six days and then you made us and you brought us right into rest. 
And Lord, when you sent your son, Father, when you sent your son, Jesus, it was so we could rest from the guilt and the shame. And we could rest from the, the, the striving and trying to be God in our lives. Lord, just like you didn't need our help with creating the world, you don't need our help with trying to figure out our problems and solutions to those problems. You already know. So, Father, would you bless us? Lord, teach us how to rest. And, Lord, when it comes to tithing, give us faith to do it. Just give us faith to jump out and watch you provide for us. Lord, thank you for the privilege of living really honestly, Lord, in such a wonderful place where you bring such provision. May it be used for your glory. With all eyes closed, I just want to make sure that there's not anybody in here that would want to receive Jesus today. You couldn't, you couldn't bring yourself, listen to me, hear me. You could not do good enough to be saved. And so God sent his son Jesus to die for your sins so that you could have life. So you could have real provision, real life from him. If that's you, I'm starting on the far left of this room. My eyes are going to move through this place. And you'd say, I need Jesus. I want to receive the Lord today. I just want to acknowledge you. Would you just raise your hand up so I can see it? I'm going to move through quickly through this, through the audience. If that's you, far left, coming through right now. Yep, coming through right here. Middle, coming your, to your right, moving through. Right under the soundboard. Yeah, good. Far, far right of this building. You'd say yes to Jesus. Good. Well, Lord, we thank you for the privilege of knowing you. Teach us, Lord, how to rest and return with a joyful heart. In Jesus' strong name, amen. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next weekend.